This video is about summarizing data. In the previous videos, we talked a little bit about how we would get data um, from uh, files either on the internet or files that we have on our local computer. Once we have the data loaded into R, then we want to do some sort of summarization to sort of see if the uh, data have any problems or to identify characteristics of the data that might be useful for us during the analysis. So why do we summarize data? The first thing to keep in mind is that almost always the data are too big to look at the whole thing. So except in very extreme circumstances, it's very difficult to just eyeball the entire data set and see uh, interesting patterns or see potential problems with the data. So since the first step is to find those problems or to find issues that are interesting to look at uh, downstream, you definitely need to summarize the data in ways that are useful for you to be able to identify those patterns. So when you do these summaries, some things that you might be looking out for are missing values, uh, uh, values that are outside of the expected ranges. So if you're defining temperature in Celsius and their measurements in um, Baltimore, if you see a measurement of 250, that's probably a little bit high, so you should no look for those sorts of things. And it, lest you think that those sorts of things never happen, it's almost always at least one or two crazy values that occur in at least every data set that I've seen. Um, you might look for values that seem to be in the wrong units, so if most of the measurements are in Celsius and one measurement is in Fahrenheit. You also want to look for mislabeled uh, variables or columns and variables that are the wrong class, so variables that look like they should be quantitative but are actually labeled as character variables and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about the ways that you can summarize data. Again, this is not comprehensive, so there are uh, a long number of ways that you can summarize data, and depending on the type of data that you're looking at, some will be better than others. So I'm going to sort of give you uh, an overview of the, the basic and most useful ways to summarize data, and if you need to summarize data in other ways, it, the, the best way to do that is to sort of look at the data type that you're summarizing and uh, search on, the, on Google. I mean, it's, seriously, that's the best way to do it. So um, this is an earthquake data set that we're going to be using to illustrate some of these ideas. Uh, this is available from data.gov. So this is another one of those examples where the time that you download the data set really matters. So this data set is actually updated every week, and it's only the earthquakes for the past seven days. So if, you run, if you're running these slides at some uh, unspecified time in the future, and it's seven days after I created them, some of the exact numbers that you're going to be seeing are going to be a little bit different. So that's just something to keep in mind uh, uh, when you're running these slides or when you're looking at these commands. If you get something slightly different, it might just be because you ran it at a different time. So this is the URL for the um, data set that we're going to be looking at. So um, again, what we can do is we can use the download.file command we learned about in the getting, lect getting data lectures. And so we can pass the file URL to download.file, and we can assign the data set to the uh, earthquakedata.csv uh, um, full file. Um, and then we can also look at the date that it was downloaded. So these slides uh, were created um, at this time on uh, Sunday, January 27, 2013. So again, if it's seven days beyond that, you're going to get a slightly different data set. And then we can read the CSV file that results in uh, using the read.csv file, and now we have that stored in the eData variable. So again, uh, the, pur the purpose of summarizing is that it's very hard to look at the whole data set. So if I just type eData and hit return and R after loading it in, I get a very long data frame. So it, it gives me sort of the variables here across uh, the uh, columns, and in the rows are each of the observations. And uh, each one of these corresponding to a specific earthquake. And so we get the, uh, the source, the equation ID, or sorry, earthquake ID, the version, and the date time. And actually, you can't actually see all the other variables that are being collected uh, or being output as well. They all actually fall off the screen here. So looking at the full data set is, is not a viable option for understanding potential patterns in the data. So here's some uh, important uh, first, these are the very first things that you always run when you load a data set into R. And so they are, first you look at the dimensions of the data frame. So here in this case I do dim of E data. And I actually end up seeing that there's a thousand earthquakes or a thousand fifty seven rows exactly. And there are ten columns. One reason that I do this always is one of the first commands that I run is because if I know that there are 11 variables and I only see 10 here, then there was a problem running, reading the data into R. Similarly, if I know that there should be a, you know, 10,000 rows and I only see 1,057, which often will happen if the data are stored in a weird format, you can actually detect if the data have been read in incorrectly from this very simple summary. 
The other thing that you can do is look at the uh, names of the variables in the data frame. And so again, you apply names to eData, and we get the list of names of the 10 variables. And so these should be the variable names that you're expecting. In this case, for the earthquake data, they are. And you can also look at um, specifically the number of rows or the number of columns in the data set. And DIM actually gives you both the row numbers, that's the first uh, number, and the column numbers, that's the second number that you get from DIM. Or you can get them individually using the num n row or n column commands. So uh, then there's some other ways that you can start summarizing the data once you've sort of looked at the very basics is in terms of just the size and shape of the data set that you've loaded in. And so one of these is for quantitative variables, you can look at the quantiles of that data set. So the quantiles are sort of like the uh, percentiles. You can imagine if you uh, took the SAT and you were at the uh, 99th percentile, then 99% of the people who took the SAT that year got a lower score than you did. This is the same sort of thing for the quantiles. So 0% uh, of the values are less than negative 61 for the eData latitude variable. This is when I do the, the quantile applied to the eData latitude. I get the 0, 25th percent, 50th percentile, the 75th percentile, and the 100th percentile. So I can see that this, is, this gives me an idea of the range of values that I observe and sort of where the middle of the values are. And so I can use this to identify if some of the values are really outside of the range. So if I saw, for example, a latitude of 5,064, you'd know that that was either measured on some scale that's very different or it's an incorrect value. You can also apply uh, the summary command uh, to the entire data frame. And so when you do that, you get uh, quantile information for um, some of the quantitative variables, um, but you also actually get um, some other information for um, the other variables, say for uh, qualitative variables. So for example, for the uh, source variable in the data frame, this is not a quantitative variable. It actually has these different characters corresponding to different um, detectors. And in this case, um, most of them were detected with this uh, AK uh, detector, and there were 330 of them that corresponded to that. So it actually summarizes both the sort of quantitative and qualitative variables for you, so you can get a first glance look at what the data set looks like and if you notice any particular problems. The other thing that's very useful is to determine if variables that should be characters are being loaded by R as uh, numeric variables or vice versa. The more likely scenario is a numeric variable is loaded as a character variable. So uh, you can do that. First, you can look at the class of the entire data frame. And of course, it comes up as a data frame. Then what you can do is you can look at the class of each individual column. So to do this, there, this is sort of a, a tricky way of doing that. So what you do is you look at the first row of the, da the data frame. So this is the eData data frame. And by uh, selecting just the first row, by uh, the, this comma here tells you if you put a, a number before the comma, it will select a row. If you put, put a number after the comma, it will select a column. And so here we've selected the first row of that eData data set. And what we'd like to do is apply that class function to every single uh, element of that first row. And we can do that with this sapply function. So what sapply does is it basically runs along and to every um, value in this vector, it applies this function. So we see that for the source variable, we get a factor. For the equation ID, we get a factor and so forth. For latitude and longitude, we get numeric variables, as well as for magnitude, we get a numeric variable. These are all sort of what we were expecting. So this is another way to determine whether the data had been loaded in properly and whether the variables are loaded in the way that you expect them to be loaded. The next step is to start looking at the actual values that you see for different variables. And so a couple of very useful functions are unique, length and table. So one uh, example is to look at the unique values. So unique values, um, some variables, particularly qualitative variables, will only have a certain number of unique values. Quantitative variables might have entirely unique values. So we're looking at this qualitative variable source and we're going to um, look at the unique values and you can see that it's listed here all the values that that variable takes. This is a way of summarizing very succinctly a qualitative variable. And if you see that there are classes of uh, uh, that variable that should not be here, you can start exploring them further. You can also look at um, the length of the unique uh, values for a particular variable. So again, we've taken the unique values for this 
uh, variable source, and we've looked at the length of that, and so we see that there are 11 unique values for source. This is another way of succinctly summarizing how many values you see, and if you expected to see more or less, you can quickly assess that you have a problem with the data. You can also do a table uh, of the qualitative variables. If you do table of a quantitative variable, you're going to get a very big table because every value will be unique and you'll get exactly one for each of the categories. But for a qualitative variable, if you do table of a qualitative variable, in this case, e data dollar sign source, you can see that each of the unique values is listed and underneath the unique value is the number of times that it appears. So remember in summary, we saw that the AK ver uh, um, the AK appeared 330 times in the source variable. And so again, when we take the table of that source variable, we see that it appears 330 times. But we also see that for all the other values that that variable can take, the number of times that it takes that value. And so this gives you an idea a little bit about the distribution of qualitative variables. The table command is actually more flexible than just allowing you to look at single variables. So suppose we want to look at the relationship between the source variable and the version variable for this uh, data set. We can do um, table of the first variable, edata dollar sign source, comma the second variable, edata dollar sign version. And we actually see a two uh, dimensional table now. So what this table shows is first uh, along the uh, y, the y sort of the rows here, we actually see the values of the source variable, a, k, c, i, and so forth. And along the columns, we see the different versions that you can have. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but also a, b, d, and e. And then what you see is the count for each cell of this table of the number of times that the source variable is equal to a, k for one of the rows in the uh, data frame, and the version variable is equal to 2. So 211 rows of the data frame have the source variable equal to AK and the version variable equal to 2. And it's the same that you get for each of the cells. So there you can kind of see the relationship between these two variables and see that, uh, for example, most of the values seem to be occurring up here among these smaller number of detectors and this smaller number of versions. You can also see, for example, places where there um, are no values like this are places where these particular um, sources, AK, CI, and so forth, do not have any values that come from these versions. So another way that you can look at data, um, in addition to table and unique, is to look at any and all. So any and all are particularly useful when looking at missing data, but also if you want to see if there's some particular characteristic and see if it exists for any of the variables in a data set. So for example, if we look at the uh, latitude data, so if we go E data dollar sign lat, and we look at the first 10 values, so this is just subsets to the first 10 of those latitude values, we see that they're listed here. And so suppose we want to see which of those values are greater than 40. It's kind of hard to eyeball it directly, but you can use, um, you can define sort of a logical variable, and the way that you do that is you do e data dollar sign lat 1 to 10 greater than 40, and so what that does is for every value it checks whether it's greater than 40 or not, and then if it is greater than 40 it reports true, so for example the third value is 65, it's greater than 40, so it's true. And if it's less than 40, here in this case 38.83, then uh, it reports false for that value. And so now we have a new vector that's the same length as this original um, 10 uh, long vector of latitudes, and it tells us which of the ones are greater than 40. And then if we want to see if any of them are greater than 40, we can just say any of these values are greater than 40, and it tells us true. So sometimes what you're looking for is just, for some variable, are there any of them that has some particular characteristic? And you can use the any uh, command to be able to check and see if that's true. The all command, on the other hand, is looking to see if all uh, values have the same property. So for example, we again define this e data sign dollar sign latitude variable to be the, all the uh, values that are greater than 40. And so what we can do is see if all of these values are greater than 40 by applying all to that variable. And in this case, we actually get set, or to that vector. And in this case, we actually get false because there are a large number of these that are actually equal to false. The only way that this would return true is if every single value of this vector was equal to true. So these two variables, or these two functions, any and all, allow you to evaluate if there are particular patterns that you observe in the data set, particularly if there's patterns that uh, affect all of the variables or affect even one of the variables.
The other thing that we can do is we can subset the values, and we can do this in more complicated ways than we saw in the original lectures. So one example is that we can use uh, the ampersand sign to do and operations. So what we're going to do here is we're looking at the data frame eData, and we're going to take the columns that equal uh, latitude and uh, longitude for this um, data set. And so we actually just want to subset to those values that have the names latitude and longitude. Those are the columns that we're going to subset to because it's after the comma. Before the comma, we actually want to look at the rows that we're going to subset to. And so what we're going to do is, again, define these logical vectors. So this is uh, e data sign dollar sign lat is greater than zero. Will be all will be equal to true whenever the latitude is greater than zero, and will be equal to false whenever it's less than zero or equal to zero. Similarly, we can define the same sort of thing for longitude. We can say we're going to define a logical vector that's equal to true whenever the longitude is greater than zero, and it's equal to false whenever longitude is less than or equal to zero. And then we want to say find all the cases where both latitude and longitude are greater than zero. So to do that, we just stick an ampersand in between them, and what you get out is a set of values where both the latitude and the longitude are greater than zero. Another case that you might want to look at is, suppose you want to look at a case where either the latitude or the longitude is greater than zero, but one of those two things has to be true. So here we use the or symbol here to be able to determine whether the, um, uh, either the latitude or the longitude is greater than zero. So in this case, you see some cases where latitude is positive and longitude is negative, and some cases the other way where longitude is positive and latitude is negative. But one or the other of these two conditions has to hold. Either the latitude is positive or the longitude is positive. So you don't see any cases where both the latitude and longitude take on negative values. So now, um, after we've looked at a couple of different ways that we can subset the data and look at unique values and all sorts of other things, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at a data set. This is a data set that uh, actually was put together for a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago on submissions and reviews in an experiment. So in this experiment, people uh, solved problems like SAT problems. They were submitted to a computer. The computer then randomly assigned them to other people to review. And then the other people that reviewed those um, uh, those problems you could either say that it was correct or incorrect and then we could learn a little bit about the peer review system. This is particularly relevant because your data analyses will be graded on a peer review system and we learned that cooperation between peer reviewers and people who were authors increased the accuracy of the review process. So we're going to look at this data because it'll show us a, a couple of other ways that we can manipulate data sets and um, look at summaries and figure out how they're working. So here we need to download actually two data sets, and so they're on Dropbox, and so we've assigned here the two URLs for the two data sets, and then we download the two files um, using the similar methodology that we've done before. Then we can read them, they're both CSV files, so we use read.csv and read the two files in, and we can look at the top of those files. So here is the top of the reviews file. We see it has an ID, a solution ID, a reviewer ID, a start and stop time, and so forth. And you can see that they're all quantitative variables here. And then we also look at the uh, head of the solutions file. Again, it has an ID, but now a problem ID. And then uh, some of the similar variables that we saw before. So one thing that we might want to do is determine if there are any missing values. And one way to, use that, to do that is to use the is.na function. So suppose that we want to look at um, the uh, reviews uh, time left variable. We can look at the first 10 values of that variable and see which of them are in A. So if you use is.na applied to a vector, what it will do is it will look at every value one at a time and then tell you whether that value is NA or missing. So in this case, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth value is a missing value of that time left variable. And all the rest are false because they're not NA values. So then the other thing that we can do is, if we have this logical vector defined by using is.na on the entire time left vector, what we can do is just use sum to calculate the total number of times that you see an NA value. So remember, true means that there's an, it's missing, it's an NA value. And so if we do sum of a logical ve ve uh, vector, what it does is it counts up the number of times that you see true. And so you see 84 uh, missing values for this reviews dollar sign time left variable. Um, and indeed, if you do a table of is.na reviews dollar sign time left, 
you're now going to look at a table of this logical vector of whether it's uh, a missing value or not. And you see that 84 of the times it's missing and 115 of the times it is not missing. So an important issue about dealing with tables and missing values uh, is going to be illustrated with this example. So here I've just created, this has nothing to do with the peer review experiment, but you can see I've created a vector and it has values 0, 1, 2, 3, NA, 3, 3, 2, 2, 3, NA being the missing value. If I type table of that uh, vector, I actually see the number of times that 0, 1, 2, and 3 appear, but I don't see the number of times that the missing indicator appears. And that's because one of the options, the use NA option, is uh, defined by default not to show NAs. So if you um, run table on that exact same vector, but you set the use NA option to if any, then if there are in NA values, you will, you will see that the NA value appears here as well. So there's one missing value in that vector. So that's just an important little trick to remember. If you're looking at the number of values in a vector and you want to make sure that you see the missing values as well, you need to change the use NA um, uh, parameter that you're passing to the table function. So another thing that you can do is you can actually summarize by rows and columns. So another way to summarize data rather than to summarize um, the uh, individual variables at the level of uh, a table is that you can actually just see what the sum of all the values are in a particular column or the mean of all the values in a particular column. So this can be useful um, when you're looking at seeing if there's sort of um, any sort of variables that have an unusually high mean or an unusually low mean. It should only apply really to values that are quantitative. And so what you can see is since we're using only quantitative variables in these reviews, we can do the column sums. The uh, column sums tells you the sum of all the reviewer IDs. In this case, that might not be a necessarily a very useful number. But you see that here the column sums for reviews are NA for the start, stop, time left, and accept parameters. And that's because if there are any NA values, the sum will always be equal to NA. So you might need to use this na.rm uh, parameter to be able to ignore the na values. And so, for example, if you take the column means of the same reviews data frame and you set na.rm equal true, then what happens is actually it takes the means of each column and it does that by completely skipping any columns where there is an na for that variable. So, for example, for the uh, start variable, it takes the mean of the start variable and it does it by um, completely ignoring any values that are equal to NA. And so you end up with, these are the values that you end up getting for each of the column means ignoring the NA values. You can also do the same thing for row means. And so all this does is instead of getting a mean for each column, it gets a mean for each row. And again, you might need to set NA.RM equals true because otherwise any row with an NA will get a value of NA when you apply row means to it. So I know that this was a super quick uh, summary of ways that you can summarize data, but this is the first pass in a data analysis, is always to run one or more or several of these functions and sort of get a feel for what the shape, structure, number of NAs, and so forth exist in that data set. It also lets you summarize a little bit the quantitative distributions of variables using quantile and, and things like that. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, data munging, and that's going to be um, the key component of any data analysis and is usually performed after summarizing uh, the data sets, but can also be performed before summarizing the data sets.